I'm Karen Kiefer, and I'm the director of the Church in the 21st Century Center. And thank you for coming. Thank you to our co-sponsors this evening, the School of Theology and Ministry, the Theology Department, and the University Communications team. They have played such a role in putting this event together, and for that we thank them. I'd also like to thank Nicholas Burns, and our panelists for their participation this evening. You're in for a treat. The Church of the 21st Century Center was founded over 15 years ago to be a catalyst and a resource for the renewal of our Catholic Church. And we continue that promise by providing resources and events like this evening. There are a couple of housekeeping items that I just want to get to. When you came into the theater, you were given an index card. The card is for you to fill out a question, a question that we might be able to ask our panelists. Um, so if you fill out a question, I ask that you take the card and then pass it in to the middle so that we can collect the cards in the middle of the program in baskets. So we'll, we'll come down each aisle. Okay, so that's first. Um, second, we are live on Facebook. So text any of your friends and family members and let them know. Now, for those people that have said to me, I'm not on Facebook, you can go to the BC uh, C21 website. That's bc.edu backslash C21. And again, this program is live. Don't you just love technology? Also, we're videotaping this event this evening, and the video of this event will be up on our website, again, bc.edu backslash c21 next week to share with others. I now have the great privilege of introducing the visionary of the C21 Center, and our 25th president, who has been serving Boston College for the past 22 years. Let's welcome Father William P. Leahy. I join Karen in welcoming you to this Church in the 21st Century event. And I'm also delighted that so many of you can be with us tonight. Our discussion and panel, I think, is most timely. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury report of earlier in the summer about decades-old cases of clerical sexual abuse, the alleged misconduct by former Archbishop McCarrick, and the inability of the American hierarchy and Vatican officials to agree on new policies to address sexual abuse by priests and bishops have taken a serious toll on the Catholic community in our country, leaving too many Catholics hurt, angry, and questioning their continued involvement in the church. I regard this evening as a twofold opportunity to not only reflect on our faith its origins and evolution, and what nourishes it, but also to consider our connections with the church and the Catholic community around us and how they might be strengthened. Certainly, our faith and sense of what it means to be a Catholic and part of the church do not depend on one person or one event. But they have been and continue to be shaped by family, prayer, sacraments, relationships, and service of others. 
I look forward to hearing from the individuals on our panel tonight. So let me introduce our moderator and put the program in his capable hands. He is a 1978 graduate of Boston College and was commencement speaker and an honorary degree recipient in 2002. Much of his life has been devoted to service of our country and to international diplomacy. He has been U.S. Ambassador to Greece and NATO, an Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. Today, he is the Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Professor R. Nicholas Burns to his alma mater. Father, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor to be with all of you. And the first thing I want to do is pay tribute to our president of this great university. He has been a real leader over the last 22 years in every possible way. And on this issue, this very difficult issue that we'll be discussing tonight, a true leader. So, Father, thank you for your leadership and guidance as we go forward. Uh, this is going to be a, a difficult uh, discussion. I want to thank the church in the 21st century and Karen Kiefer for their leadership and bringing us together. Thank our panelists, whom I'm going to be introducing in just a minute. But I did want to say this. We're meeting because the Catholic Church is in crisis. And if the church is in crisis, that means that we're in crisis as individuals and as a Catholic family. family. The clergy abuse scandal, we all know about it, we've all reflected about it, we've read lots about it. It's been devastating to Catholics in the United States and worldwide. The absence of decisive leadership by the Vatican, an absence of decisive leadership by the American bishops. Ross Douthat, columnist of the New York Times, a Catholic, wrote a column recently entitled Sheep Without Shepherds, he talks about the sorry spectacle just recently of American bishops being told to stand down by the Vatican on any action to resolve the abuse crisis until Rome could meet first several months from now. And Duthok concluded the church is in stalemate and confusion, increasingly unsure of what it teaches, led by men who cannot agree on how it might and must be cleansed. This is a true crisis of trust in the leadership of the church, of our own faith, and we'll examine that this evening. Many of us here, perhaps not the students, because time has passed since 2001 and 2002, remember the shock and almost the sense of disbelief and anger about the first revelations that came forward here in Boston about St. Julia Parish in Western, Mass in Western Massachusetts. It's a credit to Boston College that our university wants to face this crisis squarely, to discuss it openly, and to find a way forward for all of us in the church because the church is worth saving. We all know that in our parishes. We know it at Boston College given the extraordinarily beneficial influence of the Jesuit community to all of us who've been students here or professors or staff here. We know it globally because the church is one of the great global institutions. Of any institution you can think of in the world today, the church unites 1.3 billion people in Brazil and Mexico and here in North America, in Italy and France and Germany, in South Africa and Congo and Nigeria, in Japan and Malaysia. There are Catholics everywhere. There's one church that unites us, and that church is frail at times, it makes mistakes, major mistakes at times, but it's a powerful voice for human justice, a very powerful voice for the 65 million refugees and internally displaced people in the world today. And so we know this church is worth saving, and that begins with us. 
one final observation before I introduce our great speakers tonight. Of course, we're determined to uncover the truth of what happened, to expose it, and to reform the church so that it may never happen again. But I think it's important to say that we are talking about a minority of people in the church who committed these sins, who broke the law, who betrayed the trust that we had in them. The majority are faithful servants of the church. The majority are our professors and our Jesuit community here at Boston College. The majority are the dependable, hardworking people of faith that we encounter in parish life in Massachusetts and around the country. And so we're very, very grateful for Father Leahy, for Father Jack Butler. I'm grateful for Father Tony Penna. He's been my lifelong friend since he taught my religion class when I was 14 years old at St. James the Church in Wellesley. He's been my mentor. And you think about Father Penna and Father Butler and Father Leahy and hundreds of other Jesuit priests and priests of all denominations here, they are a powerful voice for our church, and we give thanks to them. So we have four people, two professors here at Boston College, two students at Boston College, who are going to talk about this crisis. And let me just introduce them to you. You have a program. You have their biographies in front of you. Professor Tiziana Deering is professor of macro practice at the School of Social Work here at Boston College. And she's co-director for the Center of Social Innovation. And she's going to be appearing on stage momentarily. <laughs> we had this worked out. Tiziana, wherever you are, now is the time <laughs> to come forward and speak. And here she is. <laughs> Let me also introduce to you one of our students. In fact, he's the youngest person on stage. He's one of the youngest persons here tonight. Sean Berry is a sophomore in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, class of 2021. He's a political science and history major. He's Navy ROTC, uh, and we welcome Sean to this stage. And here he comes. <laughs> Stephanie Sanchez, graduate school student in the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. She earned her master's in social work in May. She'll receive her master's in theology in a, in a couple of weeks. That's pretty extraordinary. Stephanie, please join us. And last but certainly not least, Professor of Theology Stephen J. Pope from the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. Professor Pope has been here since 1988. Uh, he is a prolific writer and thinker about Christian ethics. And he is also joining us on stage. So um, welcome, everybody. Here is the order of battle. We're going to discuss two big issues uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, and then we're going to go to you uh, for your questions. And Karen's already told you, please write questions on the pieces of paper. We'll read them, as many as we can take, and we'll ask our panel about them. Um, the first question I want to address to our panel is about how the church crisis has affected you as individuals. How has it affected your faith? How have you struggled with this? What has been your thought? process, where have you ended up? And the second question, it's a big question for our community, and that is, how do we move forward collectively? How must the church respond? How, much the, how must the church evolve and reform itself to regain the trust of Catholics here in America and worldwide? Tiziana, you're a Catholic. You've led Catholic charities here in Massachusetts. In my view, you live the social gospel. How has this affected you, and welcome. I appreciate the question, and I actually want to start by, um, it's a two-part question. How did it affect you, and how did it affect your faith? Right. 
Um, and I think it's important to note that I believe part of the reason I became the first woman to run Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of Boston was a result of the crisis. I think it was part of, not all of, but part of what led the Archdiocese to decide that it was important to put a woman in that very le visible leadership role, and I was that first woman. Um, and that then led to a very acute and specific experience in running one of the social ministries of the church while being female, which was very much a part of the experience. A Does that make sense? A dimension of the experience. And I think, I actually think it's really important to note that, that it is part of the reason that the church recognized it was time, to, that the, the church in the archdiocese recognized that it was in time to embrace uh, female leadership in a very specific and present way. So for me personally, I was 36 years old. It was a large organization. Uh, we were going through a financial crisis as a result of both the sexual abuse scandal and the adoption crisis that happened um, for Catholic charities. And about six months after I came on, we experienced the economic downturn of 2008. So it was a profound time. And what was interesting about that is that then required great faith, I think, to do that work and attempt to lead and be of service in that way. So I think that's important to note on the personal side. And then in terms of my faith, I want to be really clear uh, it didn't affect my faith. It tattered my relationship with the institution of the church. And it is a relationship that I think is tattered now. But that's different than my faith. Uh, and it didn't affect my faith. Um, I am angry more than I'd like to be. Um, I'm continuing to have a gender experience as I engage with my faith in a way that I'm not always looking to have a gender experience. Um, and as a mother who had her first child less than six months or, or less than 12 months into the scandal, and then the second child choosing to baptize them both in the church in those early aughts, it affects me as a parent. Um, but th that's a multifaceted set of experiences, and the thing that holds constant in all of it um, is my faith. Uh, Tiziana, you're a professor of social work, obviously here at BC. My daughter's one of the students in that program, the Graduate School of Social Work. Do you take some solace that, you know, despite the anger and frustration that I think everybody feels, that you've described as part of the social gospel, very much part of the church, especially the church that we grew up in uh, some decades ago as young kids, uh, that you can actually put your faith into action every day? Does that help you get through this? That helps me get through everything. I, I don't mean to be glib, but that is the engine and the meaning of life. Um, and that's why, despite these crises, my faith isn't shaken, because that is the engine and meaning of life, to be of service to others, to fulfill in my daily choices the solidarity and deep understanding of our shared human dignity is where meaning comes from. Um, it happens that the social work profession in particular embraces a set of principles uh, in the profession that are utterly consistent with Catholic social teaching, and I find that profound. Um, but that's the meaning of everything for me. Uh, so I think the short answer is yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sean, welcome. I was thinking about you today, when I, how would I, I would introduce you, and on, I reflected on the fact that your whole life as a Catholic has been lived with this crisis as a backdrop. I mean, for the students here, because this was first revealed in a big way in 2001 and 2002. And so that's a special burden. It takes courage for you to be here tonight. Um, how has this affected you as a Catholic? You grew up in the church. Um, how, would you describe, how would you answer that question? That's actually something that I was going to mentioned when I started, when I was thinking about this question, was that um, this is the life that I was born into, that the church is in scandal, and um, it's disheartening. And I think that it doesn't mean that there weren't problems earlier. Um, it's just about the age that we live in and the, the speed which with information travels. But something that um, I realized is that as you get older in this kind of environment, your world begins to expand that the things that were distant from you and these experiences and the news starts to become the stories and the personal narratives of people that you know. 
And one example of that would be that this summer, um, I got to know a student who had been directly affected by um, what's happening in the church right now. And at first, your first reaction is anger, and it's, it's a lack of understanding. You're not even able to, at first, emphasize with that person truly because of all of that hurt, and you don't want to take away from that individual experience. Um, and then, as you start to learn more things about maybe it affects communities nearby you, those names of towns that you hear on the local news start to, you start to think, oh, well, actually, I know people who work there, and I know people who go to church of the diocese, and that kind of, re everything just starts to really sink in. And I think that my first response was rage. Um, Tiziana, you mentioned how anger and how that you still have this anger there. Um, I think that I've let go of it now, but my first response was rage. I remember um, when I first identified this, I was sitting in mass and they were doing the collection, and all I could think of was going to put my dollar inside the collection basket was, where is this money going? Is this going to actually help the poor, or is this going because of mistakes that the church has made and will they continue to make them? And to speak to the faith part of your question, my, my faith hasn't been shaken. If anything, it's grown, because I've realized that despite all of this anger and despite all of this rage, I would much rather turn to forgiveness, ways that we can grow and change as an institution, because my faith is not the church. The church is the institution that mobilizes my faith, that has brought it to me, that has educated me into it, and that's not invaluable, but at the same time, that can be changed. It makes mistakes, and um, it's not easy. I still have anger as well, but I think that it's my duty, and just learning more about your family's history, too, you realize that these are things that have been going on for a while, and that doesn't mean that they can't change in the future. And Sean, can I just ask, has it, I mean, obviously, you had Catholic education, you had a family life as a Catholic, I know that was important to you. Has being at Boston College just these last, this last year and a half been helpful to you in maintaining that faith? Tremendous. Tremendously. Um, when I was growing up, my father had this expression when I would ask him, why do we have to go to Mass today? I would just want to go home and change after my soccer game, or why can't I just open my presents at 7 instead of at 8 after Mass? And um, he would say that I felt the same way when I was a little kid, but it's someday it just starts clicking. And I think that that was a good way of putting it, because I don't think that it doesn't just click. There's times when you feel in sync with your faith and not in sync with your faith. And I would say that until... Before I came to Boston College, um, my faith was, wasn't always constant. And I think that here I really fell into that identity. And that happened through conversations with people like you in the audience, through the things that you're exposed to in um, a Jesuit education, such as the school, but also mainly just, again, conversations, interacting with people, seeing how other people have similar stories of faith um, that you had in your life when you were growing up. Thank you, Sean. Stephanie. I know you've thought about these issues. You've been at BC as a graduate student, two degrees, very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you've had a lot of conversations about this. Tell us your story. Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely been something that has been on my mind and on my heart for a while now. Um, I think as a, as a student who's pursuing a master's in theology, um, it's something that we are constantly wrestling with. Um, and I think it's something that as, as Catholics and as Christians, we're all called to ask ourselves. Um, you know, what are, what are we doing in this church? How are, how are our hearts being moved in this moment? Um, and so it's really, it's really allowed me to take um, the information I'm learning in the classroom and really think about, okay, like, what does this mean to be a Catholic in this time? Um, and I think that's something that I've had to really take to heart in conversations and mentors. Um, I mean, even this weekend, I was home for Thanksgiving with my family and, and talking to them and saying, you know, mom, dad, like, what is this like for you and your thoughts? And my grandmother was there and, and talking to the people that are in our lives. And what does this mean for us as, as Catholics and believers in the gospel? Um, but it's absolutely affected um, the way in which I, um, my passion to get a master's of, in theology, if anything, it's given me more fire. Um, it's added some, some fuel to the fire, I would say. Um, and it's allowed me to really remember, like, why are we serving why do we go about loving every day um, to follow Christ and, and to live in that love? And if that means that we need to grow and change with the church, then that's what we're called to do. Um, so it's absolutely been something that has been on my mind and on my heart. And 
um, something that we're constantly engaging with at the School of Theology and Ministry. Um, but even here on main campus, um, we like to think we're different worlds, but we're all doing the same work. Um, and um, I, I spend a lot of time in the Kairos uh, program. Um, and these are questions that we're asking with our undergrad students as well. So this isn't just something that this is a graduate issue or a professor issue. This is a everyone who, who is Catholic and, and desires to ask these questions. Um, and my students are asking these questions, and I love to be able to wrestle it with them. Um, my goal is to help, is to challenge them to ask these questions, to not be afraid to say, what does this look like for us? Um, and so it's been a real gift to accompany students in asking questions about our faith. So Stephanie, maybe we could take your experience and just extrapolate it uh, out, out wide. Sure. Latinos are becoming, the, they'll be the majority of the church under the age of 18. Mm. Yeah. And we know that a lot of the future of the global church is in Latin America yes. and Africa. How is this crisis affecting mm. the rest of the world, or the world that you know? The yeah. Community? No, absolutely. Um, being Hispanic and being Latina um, is absolutely something that I hold very dear. Um, and recognizing that a lot of my brothers and sisters are leaving the church. Um, while they're holding a lot of the positions in, in the growing church, um, they're also leaving to other faiths because they don't feel nourished by this community. Um, and that hurts me, and I think that should hurt us. Um, and so I think we need to ask, like, why are people leaving our church? Um, is it because we're not reaching out to them? Is it because our, um, our masses, our communities aren't welcoming? Like, what is it about this place that people are leaving because they don't feel fulfilled by this church? Um, and so that's something that's really been on my heart of um, are, are each of our populations really being served, um, even if um, we project the numbers of Latinos um, in Hispanic ex, you know, communities, um, we have to pay attention to those that are leaving um, and joining other faiths because they don't feel as connected. Um, and that's certainly something that, um, yeah, is going on as well. Thank you. When we get to the second question, we're going to talk more about the global nature of this crisis, because it's not just the United States. It's the rest of the world yeah. that's dealing with this as well. Thank you very much. Professor Pope, Stephen, uh, one of the ways I prepared for this evening, because I am the least knowledgeable person of the five people on this stage, was to read a paper that Professor Pope has been writing. He was good enough to share it with us, and it's an extraordinary look at the scale and depth of the crisis. How has this affected you as a professor of theology, but also you and your faith? Um, in one way, I don't know what to say. Um, I'm a professor, so I'm supposed to be good with words and have lots of words. We keep professing, professing, professing. <laughs> but I really think um, the depth of the problem is so profound that we're just beginning to come to terms with it. I think there are layers of deception, misplaced loyalty, hidden suffering that we're just beginning to hear about, especially if we place this in a global context where a lot of churches don't, around the world, don't have an aggressive press an independent government uh, with district's attorney, uh, where the church is more off bounds. So I have to say, I did and I do find it shaking to my faith. Um, it's shaking not in the sense that I'm, I'm going to go abandon the Catholic Church. Uh, it's shaking in that I continually have to wrestle with the hypocrisy of the church. It's shaking to me because my faith is very ecclesial. It's very churchy in the sense that I do believe in my heart that the church was founded by Jesus. Uh, as you know, the people he picked were a rather unsavory group and they were not always on the ball and not always towers of strength. Uh, but there are also a, a lot of good, well-meaning disciples who have their good days and bad, and I guess that continues. I guess my faith uh, is challenged 
on the level of asking, where is God in all this? The question of divine providence. Where is God leading us? It certainly feels to me like we're in a dark forest and we've lost the trail. And the guys that were supposed to bring the flashlights forgot to bring them. And we can't see the stars because the canopy's blocking us. And we're really stumbling in the dark. And yeah, there are things that have been done that have been really good. The Dallas Charter had some really important innovations in 2002. Um, but in some ways, that's just the beginning. It's a short-term, immediate solution to the problem of child sexual abuse. Uh, but my faith is also challenged, not in the performance of living up to norms, but on what kind of a community do we want to be? What kind of a community do we want the church to be? Can we relate to? Can we find the face of Jesus in the church? So that's, that's the, you know, the suspended state I'm in right now, and I think a lot of my colleagues are in. Uh, that's just, an, you know, Father Leahy asked us to be honest, so that's my honest answer. I'm wrestling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling as a theologian that's trying to convince students to take Christianity seriously, to see the beauty that I see in the church. I'm struggling with adolescents in the classroom who are living in a world that's increasingly secular. Our society is in a free fall regarding religious practice with under 30-year-olds. We're also living in a society that has a problem, a rampant problem of sexual abuse in any and all industries and domains of human society. From sports to athletics and athletics to entertainment to academia to the military to politics, you name it. We have a serious problem of abusing minors and abusing women. I don't think we're getting it. I really don't. I think there are a lot of well-meaning people, but I think we really do have a, a crisis, and it's an ongoing crisis. And I think the crisis we see now is pointing to problems that have existed for a long time. Professor Pope, um, thank you for that. Um, I think we needed to hear about the dimensions of the crisis. You've given us a good description of it. How is it, as a faculty member, as a theologian, how has it affected your work since 2002? Has it changed the trajectory of what you thought you would be doing? Has it led you down different roads? Are there answers here? Or maybe start thinking about this second question. If church in the 21st century was the response by Boston College, the right response in 2002, the logical question is, what's our response now as we see the crisis is deeper than we thought? because of the grand jury report in Pennsylvania, because of the revelations about Cardinal McCarrick that were shocking. How has it changed you as a professor or, or your field, and, and what's the way out of that forest? The second part of that's a lot harder than the first. Mm -hmm. The way out, I told you, we're in, I feel like I'm, I'm in the forest, but what this has convinced me of is of three things. First. I think we really need to listen to victims. I think we need to have a way of hearing the stories of victims and not rush to superficial assurances, not rush to promote forgiveness too early, not to minimize what the pain is that they've gone through, and not to underestimate the pain of the shame that they feel as people who are abused. So that's the first thing. We need to listen. I, th I mean all of us. I think it's a mistake to say the hierarchy is a big problem. There, is, there are challenges there, but every person has to be open in their heart to listen. The second aspect of it to me is I think I've become more committed to trying to cultivate empathy in myself and in my students than I did when I came here. When I came out of graduate school, I was steeped in discourse about arguments and evidence and fallacies, and mainly how to operate cognitively with precision and rigor. And as I've been at BC 30 years now, long time, um, 
I've come to see my work more as intellectual and also spiritual and emotional formation. I want to help people grow into mature, responsible, spiritually deep human beings. I can only do that if I'm on the same path. And I can do that if I can help them and me, my students and myself, become people of empathy and compassion. Without empathy and compassion, your reasoning just becomes self-serving or rationalizing or self-deception. And that's maybe the most profound problem of this whole scandal is the depth of dishonesty in the church. So the first point is listening. The second is empathy. The third is I think we need to have a much bigger imagination about the kind of community the church can be. I think we're too locked into assumptions about structures and forms and relationships without thinking blue sky about what the church could be and how we in our own lives as Catholics or Christians can make a difference on a local level uh, to take responsibility with that imagination. So those are the three things right off the top that I think I've changed in the course of my time here and largely stimulated by the crisis that broke in 2002 and continues to, to unfold before our eyes. Thank you. I think you've given us a really good sense that it's not just some in the leadership that are solely responsible for responding and fixing the church. It's everybody in the church at all levels of the church. And your idea about new structures, that gets to reform. That gets to the necessary institutional reform that I think the American bishops were trying to think about when they were told to stop. Uh, and I guess that conversation will now continue in Rome in a couple of months' time. But Tiziana, you've obviously thought about this. I mean, how, from your perspective, building on what Stephen has said, are there certain elements of reform that as Catholics we should be thinking about at every level of the church? Are there some obvious things that haven't been done that should be done? How would, how would you address that? So one of the... I'm going to preface my answer by saying that one of the frustrating things about this kind of discussion is this is an issue of great complexity. Um, and I don't say that to weasel my way out of an answer, but instead to say that there are so many dimensions to the answer and, and it's hard to acknowledge and do justice to all of them, right? It took thousands of years to build the institution, so a 45-minute conversation is going to touch the surface of of some of the changes. I will say, you know, I, I, teach a, I teach a course on change leadership. And I've done turnaround as a, as a leader in charge of an organization a couple of times, including, I would argue, at Catholic Charities. And in those moments, there are some things that you need to do, and then there are some things that you need to do fast. So for this conversation, I decided to focus on a couple of really practical things and things that I think need to be done fast. Uh, in the early 2000s, I, I got asked to and accepted the responsibility of serving on a committee that I don't think a lot of people knew was happening, which was called the Full Financial Disclosure Committee for the Archdiocese. Uh, and it was just as Cardinal Law was leaving and Cardinal O'Malley was coming on, and it was a group of lay people, and our job was to dive into every corner of the finances of the Archdiocese of Boston, every corner. Uh, look at every number, every transaction, every use of money, and create a pattern of transparency that then led to the preparation of the financials of the archdiocese to begin to make decisions about how to settle lawsuits. Um, that was, I think, an example of exactly how lay people uh, begin to become involved immediately in transparency and accountability in ways that are fairly profound, um, are painful, but are necessary both to shine light and increase trust. So uh, increasing lay engagement in, in financial transparency, uh, complete cooperation with law enforcement and other lay institutions that will again rebuild a sense of trust, commitment, transparency, um, creating partnerships with lay people in every aspect of the administration of the institution there is the pastoral dimension of the institution and the administrative dimension. And one doesn't have to change any policies, practices, or procedures. Well, that's not true. One does not have to change any policies. 
uh, to deeply engage lay people in those things, like the full financial disclosure committee did. And um, there, are, there are two other things I would say. One is um, one cannot go forward with the same team. You can't. Some bishops are going to have to change. Whether um, you cannot go forward with the same team uh, and have a sense of uh, trust and credibility, uh, one has to make those signals of change. One has to. And I think the last thing I would say, and I'm going to be really honest, I, I, I actually said to a colleague, I saw her at church on Sunday, and I said, I, I, I want to see more women engaged, and I don't have a good explanation other than duh. And I need a better <laughs> way to talk about it on the panel than duh, because that is not in any way sophisticated. And she was like, well, good luck with that. <laughs> so I went home and I thought about it, and I talked to my 16-year-old, and she said, Mom, you should just say duh. <laughs> so, and you so said, duh. I did. And it, it was effective. So I actually, I was going to ask you, T. Siana and Stephanie, about this. Clearly one of the answers has to be to appreciate the role of women in the church, to elevate women in the church, to think of women as leaders of the church. I have two cousins, Sister Kathleen Toomey and Worcester at Assumption. Sister Maureen Toomey, Sisters of the Notre Dame in Springfield, they've been 50 years leaders in the church, but largely below the surface. Is part of the answer, I'm asking the two women on the panel, and the men, that women need to come forth and lead? You're a young leader. All right, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, gosh, there are a lot of good and holy women who are ready to step up. Um, and our church has silenced them or put them down and said, no, you stay there. Um, and I'm really tired of it. I really am. Um, as someone who is about to complete my second master's degree, um, I think that we can do a lot of good work in this church. And we're not going anywhere. Like, I think that there's an assumption that because we are Catholic women, that it's like, oh, sorry to hear you're Catholic. And like, that's not, like, I love being a Catholic woman. I love it. But that also means that I'm going to step into the shoes. I'm ready to go. Like, there's a lot of good and beautiful work to be done by Catholic women, by Catholic sisters, by mothers. And we need to allow them to jump in. I think we've been so afraid of, of what will women do or um, it's like, let the bishops deal with it, let the cardinals, let the pope. And I love Pope Francis. I'm a huge Pope Francis fan. But let's get the women in the room, okay? Um, I think they've got a lot of good to say. Um, I would be happy to be in the room. And I just think that, um, I mean, I was raised in a family. Um, I have an older sister. Um, and it, my younger brother, like, he's bigger than me, but, like, hear me roar. Um, I think we need, that, we need that spirit in our church as well. So. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Sean, let me bring you in here. And these are hard issues. Part of the answer has to be that we need to be multi-generational in church. The hierarchy of any institution in our society, including our, my university, is, tend to be older people. But the answers have to come from the younger people, the middle-aged people, that's the entire church. There's a lot is resting on your shoulders, not you personally, <laughs> but your generations to take the church forward. Is that discussion here at, among the religious students at Boston College? And, and where are some of the answers on reform? So as far as my thoughts on reform, I'll touch on that piece first. Um, I would echo what Stephen said earlier as far as um, the importance of listening, the importance of accountability, and that that needs to be done quickly um, because the longer that we wait, the less trust that we're going to have in the church um, when this blows over. And then the third thing is community. And the important thing with your question is to realize that the young people in the room and myself, we are a part of that community. And that when we continue to say that you're the future leaders of the church, and it's not just in the church, it's in other institutions as well, it alienates us from what we can do now, what we can do today. And that 
can we influence policies and practices and those kinds of things? To be honest, I'm not even as educated as other people on the panel about those things. But the, the difficult thing about this panel is that when you ask this question, like, why am I still in the church? You, you have to grapple with that. I didn't know the answer to that when I was asked to speak on this panel at first. And I think that the reason why, um, or I guess a, a, one of the bigger aspects of that is that I have the power to make small changes and that there's small, the small things that you do, whether it be interactions with people, um, you know, about women in the church. My mother is a huge reason why I'm Catholic right now. And just, it was always the small things. It wasn't always taking me to mass. It would be pulling over on the side of the road, seeing a man with a shopping cart with bottles in it to go and collect for a small change so he could pay for a meal. And my mom rolling down the window a little bit, handing him the money and then just saying, God bless you. That's what it means to be Catholic. And those kinds of small interactions are things that all of us, the young people in the room, can be doing. And it's not that we have some kind of, um, it's not only that we have responsibility to it, but that's something that we should want to engage. Because I know from personal experiences and from my friends and my peers that you really grow. And um, it's so much healthier for you than staying angry. Um, so that's kind of something that I would love for the younger people in this room to engage with me in is that, Rather than saying we're going to be the future leaders, recognizing that, but you own that by being, by being a leader today, right now. So those are my thoughts on it. And thank you, Sean. You know, I really agree with what you said. It's not enough for someone to say you're future leaders, you and Stephanie. You're, you have to be leaders now, and you are leaders now. You're on the stage leading right now. Um, one of the advantages that we have at Boston College is that we believe that we should be men and women of faith and we should be in the world. And a lot of our students go to Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Some of our students probably work for Tiziana at Catholic Charities. When I lived around the world, I saw the incredible power and reach of Catholic Relief Services as an agent of the church to do good things for people who needed the, the help. Does that help on a generational basis that there are outlets here to be Catholic, not just in mind, not just in the church, the building itself, but in the world, to both of you who are students? Yeah, I think there's, there are so many beautiful ways um, to engage our faith in service um, through campus ministry, through the Pulse programs. There, I mean, there are tons here at BC. Um, something that I've, I've been thinking about as well is also being a minister outside of ministry roles, right? Like we are not just called to be Catholics in Catholic spheres, but Catholics everywhere. Um, that's something that has really been on my heart because um, I'm someone who um, I'm looking to apply my faith into social work practice in places that um, maybe are not um, uh, Catholic headquarters necessarily, um, but really engaging with every person um, but yeah, there are, there are tons of things to do here at BC. Um, the Four Boston programs, the Appalachia programs, the Arupe programs, I know the majority of those are campus ministry related, but um, are so strong in allowing um, young people to see what faith looks like on the ground um, and working with people uh, side by side. So, um, can I just add to that Please briefly? Shine. Yes. Um, so in addition to all those wonderful programs, there's also this program called Ever to Excel, which is for high school mentors. There's the Loyola House, which is a house of Jesuit discernment for people who are considering um, a vocation in the Jesuits or another religious order. And um, I, I want to give a, an anecdote here because I think that it's important to something that we touched on earlier, which is the idea of community, that we're living in a secular world, and that people aren't buying in. Why are people leaving the church? what is happening. Um, in my role as president of the Knights of Columbus on campus, we are a fraternal men's organization. And what we do is we meet and we work together as Catholics to discern those different things. And we always say that when we do our service projects, we work with other people. And we do. We have people who are Lutheran, Muslims, women work alongside of us. But something that I realized thinking about the topics on this panel is that do the people that we work with that aren't Catholics feel that same sense of identity with those core values of service, integrity, and love? And the answer was no. So a small thing that we're, we've been trying to do is that we started this group called the Our Lady of Guadalupe Volunteers. And to be a member, to be a volunteer of Our Lady, you don't need to be a Catholic, you don't need to be um, a male or anything. You just have to have a commitment to those values. And I think that the best way to get people to not leave the church and to show them that 
what's happening with the sexual abuse and everything. That's not the church. That's not what our faith is, is to be willing to take them by the hand and walk with them on that journey. And if you're not willing to welcome them to that sense of identity, to that commitment, to those values, um, it's not going to happen. So I think that that's something that I'm trying to do in small ways, is to be more open to allowing people to accompany me and to feel that sense of belonging um, and being present and there for them to have those conversations. So at this point in the proceedings, I have to say, we're not looking at future leaders, we're looking at current leaders in Sean and Stephanie. Thank you for giving us some hope, <laughs> truly. Um, I'm gonna take your questions and the procedure will be that Karen will give me the questions, I'll read the questions, we'll ask the panelists to answer them, and we'll try to get as many of your questions in as possible, but I wanna ask one last question to all of you, but I want to leave with Stephen and Tiziana because it gets to reform. Tiziana, you said we need some new leadership. Stephen, you said we need to think about structures. Is, are our Catholic universities an example of the way out? My experience here at BC is that it's a perfect, beautiful intermingling of the Jesuit community and lay people and professors of all faiths and some people who aren't particularly religious, but the institution works as a Catholic institution. Are, the, are those some of, can we look within for some of the answers to the way out of this crisis? I'm trying Tiziana. to be respectful because I've talked twice and you've only talked once. You're smarter than I am. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, and. Um, one of the things that has been um, deeply rewarding, I, I, this is my sixth year at Boston College, and one of the things that has been deeply rewarding is to be in a community that genuinely believes in men and women for others that not only believes, and that believes in the formation of young people to become men and women for others, and has actually established in its strategic plan formation of the rest of the Boston College community as well. I, I take great pride in that, and I think it's quite important. I think it, that also means that we have to constantly challenge ourselves to increase the diversity of experiences that we encounter, the openness to um, men and women from everywhere, uh, the opportunity to create shared experiences across difference. And um, we have the perfect environment to do that and the constant call to do more of it as we begin, as, uh, no, begins not the word, as we continue on a journey of fully forming as men and women for others. And I think a university that, uh, uh, this university and Catholic universities that embrace that mission and seek the danger of encountering the whole world uh, while doing it have um, an incredible opportunity to become of service in profound and deep ways. Thank you. Stephen. I agree with what's been said, but I think sometimes we can think about Catholicism and our commitment to the church as a numbers game. Something like the yield from recruiting a freshman class for basketball or football, and it depends how many four-star athletes you get for the team. Uh, and I think that's natural as a sociological reality that we're a large institution of higher education. The danger is that we wind up playing the higher education game on the terms set by, Catholic, uh, by higher education in general, and we can easily lose uh, what we're really about, or what we were about as a Jesuit school. Um, I'm not saying we're there, but I think there's a tension between a corporate model of a university and a university here to train and help people become a mature people of faith and service. In my experience, uh, when I was a kid going to Bellarmine High School in Bellarmine College Prep in San Jose with the Jesuits, the the mantra was a faith that does justice. And it's because people assume the a substance of Catholic faith. And the whole effort of the Jesuits there was to convince us that faith has justice implications. And they were very good at it. They had us pick us picketing with Cesar Chavez and 
marching and, and boycotting lettuce and all that, and it was great. Probably why I'm doing social ethics now is because of those Jesuit scholastics. Now that game has entirely shifted, the challenge has changed completely. I see a lot of students involved in service programs, and it's their idealism and their goodness and their altruism that sometimes is very inspiring to me, uh, what they give themselves to and the compassion they have for people. What's my challenge, and I think the challenge facing BC, is to show the students that in that desire to serve and in the love for those who are the least among us, that's God speaking to them. That's the voice of Jesus calling them in a quiet way to a deeper recognition that what they're engaged in is really transcendent. And it really ele it's an elevation of who they are beyond just being consumers and beyond just being careerists, that there's something a lot deeper for us. I think service can actually be misused as something you put on your resume, as a way of getting an internship, as a marker to get you into the grad school of your choice. And it's, I don't think anybody does it deliberately here, but I think we need to be a little bit, um, a little bit more careful in peeling away the misuse of service and altruism and, and compassion and try a bit more to talk about faith as the calling to live more in a more real and a more compassionate way. And that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a community of people that are real and that are compassionate. Uh, and I think that's, the, that's what we need to move on a small level at BC in our Cura groups or our campus ministry groups, and, and they do a very good job in a lot of ways. And it's also, I think, where the church as a whole needs to go. Uh, the answer to secularism isn't service. It's the question, who do you trust? Is there a goodness underlying that service that's transcendent? I want to thank... I want to thank Stephen and Stephanie and Sean and Tiziana uh, for a deeply thoughtful discussion. And we're just getting started. We're going to get to your questions. But I guess one of my takeaways from just listening to all of you is that we've got a monumental job ahead to rebuild the church and to respond to this crisis. We're not going to resolve every issue tomorrow. But you've given us a start of how Boston College and the people here can be part of it. And that gives me hope. Thank you. So we'll read as many questions. We'll get as many questions in as we possibly can. And the first question, Sean, is for you. Um, and here's how it reads. So as a young man who celebrates his Catholic faith, how do you respond to people who belittle your faith or question its purpose, if, that's, if that happens to you? Sure. Um, I would say that at BC it's less likely to happen, but in the general world that it, it does happen. And that a sad thing is, is that we or our society can commonly conflate religious beliefs to mean idealism and to not mean they're actually engaging with the problems of the real world. And if anything, my faith is what gets me through my day-to-day -day interactions with people, um, my challenges, it gives me courage when I feel like I'm alone. And I think that the best way to express that and to tell people that it's not a silly idea is to take it seriously. And that um, it's not enough to just be a Catholic and go to Mass and then have this kind of interior self if you're not willing to actually live that out and share that you live that out with other people. So it could be something simple as if you sit down and have dinner in one of the dining, hall here, dining halls here on campus, um, like make the sign of the cross. You don't have to say a whole grace or anything. Maybe something small like that. And then somebody's going to be like, what was that? Which, which happened once. And What did you say? I said, oh, I just like to say grace before I start eating. And do I always remember to that? No. But, or other things like, I'm going to Mass right now. Instead of being like, oh, i got to go meet a friend, or I'm going to go eat, or something like that. No, like, I'm, I'm going to Mass, so I'm going to tell you I'm going to Mass. And if people are like, oh, I don't understand that. Um, it's, it's not about telling people, do this, otherwise you're not going to go to heaven. Or do this, otherwise you're not going to be a good person. It's about just being open about what you're doing and the ways that it helps you. It's going to be different for everybody. But giving that vulnerability and allowing people to walk with you, they're going to have a curiosity. They're going to want to know more, whether it leads to them becoming a Catholic, practicing their faith, faith more, who knows, but they'll be more open to having these kinds of discussions going in the future if you're willing to take that step. Thank you. Um, here's a second question. 
um, my 14-year-old son talks about becoming a priest. I'm struggling with how to react to that thought. So currently, <laughs> Go. I, I live inside of a um, house called the Loyola House. And I learned about the house because I did a lot of courses on the Jesuits, and I started to learn about it, and what does Ignatian spirituality mean, and who are these Jesuits they are involved in? Everything from science to mathematics, arts, history, statesmanship. And I was really curious, and I felt this kind of calling inside of me. And because of the central location that faith is in my life, if I felt a calling to become a priest, that's something that I would be willing to say yes to if I felt that calling. The purpose of the house is to live there and to live in a community of other people who feel that similar calling and who would be willing to exploring that and discerning that more. And in, this, in the light of this whole um, crisis, it's disheartening because you think about the commitment to become a priest is to give your entire life um, for something. And in having conversations with other people who are interested in this kind of lifestyle or are also seriously considering becoming Jesuits, it's something that's on our minds. And again, uh, it just goes back to what is the Catholic faith and what is not the Catholic faith. Sexual abuse is not the Catholic faith. It's not the Catholic church. That's not what you're giving your life to. And if anything, the church right now is in need of young men and women and men and women in general, to just step up and be willing to actively discern those kinds of positions, whether it's to um, a religious title such as a priest or a nun, or if it's to become more involved in leading lay people in that service. So I would say that it's important to encourage that and to not worry, um, as long as he discerns that with an open heart. And something my dad always says is, um, we were promised that there would be sheeps, I mean wolves in sheep's clothing. So keeping all those in mind, I think that's important. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful. Stephen. I was 14 once. <laughs> I was brought to a seminary for, for a weekend at the boardwalk in Santa Cruz. I thought, I'll be a priest. I could go to the boardwalk every day. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> um, I thought about becoming, I was very serious about becoming a Jesuit, and uh, then I started dating my wife. <laughs> um, and, I, and I have two uncles that are Jesuits, and I've been really, really inspired by the Jesuits and think it's a great way of life and very good people. Um, if I were director of formation, though, I think I would have one rule, not a hard and fast rule, but my one rule for entering seminary across the street or any religious order is you have to have been in love with someone once in your life before you enter. I think the underlying issue of of uh, sex abuse has nothing to do with celibacy. It has a lot to do with emotional maturity and sexual, psychosexual integration. And it has to do with dealing with the difficulty of growing up and the desire for intimacy and companionship and sex. And unless you have some awareness of what it is to be intimate with somebody, emotionally, I don't think you know what you're getting into. I'm amazed that so many good priests going through the old system, have been able to make those developmental leaps without the challenge that I had to face and my friends have had to face to get some semblance of maturity. But that's the thing I worry about the most is with seminarians, and it's, it's really 14-year-olds ridiculously young to be thinking about being a priest, in my opinion. Uh, but in 10 years, get an education, fall in love, see what life is. Uh, that's the path that James Martin and um, a lot of other people that I know in the priesthood, and it, it makes them, I think, students say more relatable. It helps them understand the people they're preaching to and counseling and, and uh, engage with sacraments to know what they've been through and what it's like. I've been praying really. I've been praying really hard the last three or four minutes about whether or not to say what I'm about to say, and I decided to say it. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a priest too. Yeah.
Thank you, Tiziana. Third question. What would you say to a friend who has decided to leave the church? I'm, I think everyone's had that conversation. I think everyone here has had that conversation with somebody in our family, in our community. Stephanie, what do you say? It's okay. I still love you. That doesn't change anything. I think, I think we can often think of people leaving the church as some kind of betrayal or um, like how could they leave or, or we, can, we can be upset when at times like we have no idea what they're going through. We don't know their story and the best thing to do is to sit with them, to accompany them and say, um, you know, like I'm so sorry if there's anything that has happened to you. I'm so sorry if I wasn't a good enough friend to you, um, but I love you. You know, I think that there's so much to be said about just sitting with someone um, and, and, and not to be angry um, and just really to be genuine and say, I'm here for you if you ever want to talk or if you ever need anything. Um, I want to still hear about your life and your faith life and all these things for you. Um, I think that when people leave, we can also often think, um, well, you're not Catholic, so what, you know, how can we talk about God? And, you know, I believe that God is God and um, we can engage um, in the same way, whether someone is Catholic or not. Um, so, yeah, definitely with a, a spirit of, of openness, of transparency, um, and that relationship doesn't change. So. Thank you. Anybody else want to? You know, four years ago, last month, next month, my mother passed away. And I'm from a very large family. I'm the youngest of eight living kids. And uh, at the funeral mass, the, the priest said, peace be with you. And every single one of my siblings said, and also with you. Um, <laughs> because it had been that long since they'd been in church. <laughs> and it was like this moment where half the congregation said, uh, and with your spirit. And then you heard this, and also with you. <laughs> and uh, afterward, we had a conversation in our family about that moment, right, at the Mass, and um, why so many in my family had left the church and why a couple of us had stayed. One of my brothers is actually a, a deacon. And um, I think if you don't develop at some point in your life a deep personal relationship with Christ uh, and with how it brings meaning to your life, I think it's easy to leave the church. And I think as a result, one can never judge someone else for that choice. But I think you can constantly, um, if invited, share why that personal connection is so important to you and keeps you in the game. Thank you very, very much. Um, the next question is somewhat related. What about for non-Catholics? Why should I, as a non-Catholic, join the Catholic Church in a time of scandal? It's a powerful question. How would four Catholics or one or two Catholics on this stage answer that really good question? Stephanie's ready. Stephen's thinking about it. I can just read the. I'm suppressing myself. Stephanie, why don't you lead? Sure. For me, if someone came to them and said, "I'm not Catholic. Why should I? Why should I become Catholic?" Um, belief in the Eucharist, in, in the teachings of the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. That to me takes over anything that's going on wrong in the church. Any any anger, any hurt. I come back every Sunday because I believe in Jesus. Um, and, yeah. That, that's a, I know that's like a big answer, but for me that's, that's like... That's a good answer. That's the foundational. That's on, yeah. That is the heart of why I'm there, why I'm not going anywhere, is because of belief in the Eucharist. Stephen? I guess my answer would... De it depends on the person, of course, who's making the statement and where they're coming from what they're looking for. Um, I worry about, I would say joining is even an odd idea, but joining for the wrong reason. Um, pressured into it because they're going to get married. Um, guilt because they've fallen away, lapsed, the lovely phrase, 
and they want to come back and be confirmed. Um, there are good reasons, of course, and I think uh, Stephanie put her finger right on the issue. Is this, where, is this a community in which you find Jesus? Is this a community in which you find Christ? Does joining the church uh, give you a sense of peace as well as aggravate you because you have to be realistic? The more you love the church, the more aggravated you get. Um, and I do think, for me, the analogy that makes sense of joining the church is just like becoming an in-law in a dysfunctional family. <laughs> you, you, you love your, you love your fiancé, but geez, they're nuts. What are nut, nutty relatives? <laughs> and you got the alcoholic, and you got the guy that's got a gambling problem, and you got the guy that won't shut up. <laughs> and family reunions can be hilarious and also a nightmare. Um, so I guess what I want to say is, do you know what you're getting into? This is the human race. It's not some kind of fiction uh, made up of angels uh, and guys in funny clothes. This is a real human community. It's the whole spectrum. Here comes everybody, right? And if you can love human beings and find Christ with human beings in all of our messiness and sin mixed up with beauty, well, then you're welcome. Come on in. You know what you're getting into. And if you don't know now, you're going to find out. <laughs> Could I just add, Stephanie and Stephen, you know, I, in, in my opening remarks, I said there are 1.3 billion Catholics. And for me, as a person who's interested in how America relates to the rest of the world and how the world functions or doesn't, the church is a powerful force for good. It's done a lot of damage, which is why we're here tonight to talk about the damage. But if you think about Catholic Relief Services helping Palestinians in the West Bank. 30 years ago, I was on the West Bank coordinating American economic assistance, and Sister Barbara, that's how we knew her, led the effort. And that was a Catholic-inspired humanitarian effort to help Palestinians live under, endure the occupation. And then on an even higher global plane to see the Secretary of State of the Vatican, to see the power of the Vatican in conflict mediation, to see the Vatican intercede, sometimes when the United States had problems with someone, to be a buffer and a referee. And the last example I was just thinking of listening to the two of you is, and I mentioned it before, Father Penna. If you haven't met Tony Penna at Campus Ministry and you're a student or faculty or staff member here, meet Tony Penna. Force for good. And he has been for so many of us individually, but he is for us collectively. So there's a power in the church and I guess I'd say if a friend of mine who is not Catholic, why should I join your church? That's part of the answer, but I think you've given us an even better part of the answer. Here's a really challenging question I think that all of us get and all of us think about. Will we ever see married priests? If not, why not? Would it make a difference? Can I just add, will we see women on the altar? Why shouldn't we see women on the altar? Who wants to tackle that? Tiziana, since I think it's free, I think you need to lead on this. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't believe we will see either of those things in my lifetime. That's the truth. Um, I believe over time, um, first, if I've got my history right, there was a time early in the church's history when we did have married priests. So we have seen it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there, I'm, I'm at war with myself between the practical answer and the other one. The practical answer is over time, yes. Uh, demographics, the needs of the institution, et cetera, yes. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get there. I think that way, I'm, I'm probably both, uh, based on pure need. Um, but I hope that over time, I have never, ever before in my career um, made a public statement about women as priests, ever, uh, ever, until right this minute. Um, there are so many gifts that so many people bring, so much grace that so many people can bring in service to others, and I think the real vision is to allow for all those gifts 
all those perspectives and all the ways that we can pastorally care for each other. And my dream would be that that would be the case one day. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Two more questions. Can I make a quick comment? Please do. We actually yeah. already do have married priests. We have married priests of so the Eastern Rite Catholic Church, Fair enough. and we have Anglicans that have become Roman Catholics. They've joined the church and being able to uh, keep their wives and children. Pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> we know the gospel is costly, but it's not that costly. <laughs> so um, I, I think my own view would be it would be a great boon to the church because I know a lot of people who I teach at BC that would be excellent priests, and some have even spoken to me about it, and uh, say that the obstacle is that they would like lifelong companionship in children. And I do think they have a calling. I think young women have a calling uh, to the priesthood that they're unable to exercise in this church, and it's to all of our detriment. We're all, we're all, we're all harmed by that, and I do think it'll come. It's, the church is a very slow learner, uh, so it's, who knows how long it will take, but Pope Francis is already making, uh, encouraging different regions of the world, and particularly the Amazon, to talk about whether married uh, clergy would be helpful in their areas where there's such a deprivation of priests. So I think it's not completely unrealistic that this could happen in our lifetime, in some regions of the world. Thank you. Um, we're going to take two more questions. I have one more question to read from the audience, and then I have a final quick question. You all know what it is. We're going to end on that. Uh, give us hope as we leave. Um, but this is a very basic, but it's a beautiful question. It's a difficult question. Where is God in all of this for you? I had a conversation with someone recently, and they said that, you know, like, I'm, I'm religious, but whenever I think about God or whenever I pray or anything or think about coincidences in my life, I attribute them to the universe instead of God. Because when I think of God, I think of this superior being, and I don't like that fact that he's above. And I thought that was interesting because I never saw God in that way. I see God in when my friends are mourning the loss of a loved one and they stop into St. Joseph's Chapel for a candlelight mass, or when after um, a hurricane went through one of my friend's towns, she would attend beach masses with her old community. It was a place of reconciliation. Or when my father invited a homeless person to come and eat lunch with us for the diner. Those small instances are God, and I think that it's important to pay attention to them. And the reason why you need to pay attention to them is because they're very subtle. Um, I met somebody recently, and she was telling me that when she was deciding to come to BC, she was very stressed because there was a lot of big decisions, and it was made to seem as if what college you choose to go to is the biggest decision you make in your life. And she expressed to her mother that that's not the biggest decision for me. The biggest decision for me is who I marry. The next day after that conversation was admitted Eagles Day here at Boston College, and the Jesuit who was giving the talk um, to the students that day said that the biggest decision you make isn't going to be where you go to college, it's going to be who you marry and what your family looks like in the future. And of course I thought, oh my gosh, like, that's incredible, that's amazing. And I asked her, oh, this is the important part. I asked her, <laughs> so how is your relationship with that Jesuit now? Do you stay in touch and everything? And she said, well, I have never talked to him about this. And I was like, why? At first, like, how can, how can you not express this? But what she said was that, but, I know that he gives the 11 o'clock mass every single Sunday at this chapel, and I always go and I always sit there and everything. So I think that the small things do matter, and that that's where you truly see God, and that it has a massive impression on the people that are sitting in this room around you, and even though they may never tell you that, it's there and it's influencing them. So that's what gives me a lot of hope. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I'll jump in. Please. Uh, I'm going to reframe the question just a little bit because I'm a graduate student and we do this a lot. Um, so, If you don't like the question, just answer the question you wish they had asked. I got gotcha. you. Um, <laughs> but it was a, it's a good question. Oh, it's a, it's a great question. Whoever wrote it, love it. For me, where is God in this? 
for me, it's more of where is the spirit in this? Um, because so many of the conversations I've had at the Graduate School of Theology, um, at the School of Theology and Ministry, with my students in Kairos, at, you know, on, on this side of campus, um, I think it, it really is, is where is the spirit calling me to move right now? You know, what is my next step? I'm in the process of looking for a job, and so really, like, I've been asking even in, in prayer, like, okay, Lord, like, where do you want me to serve? Like, where, where are there sheep that need to be led? Mm-hmm. Um, this is something I'm asking daily um, of, okay, like, where are the needs and how can I fill them? Um, I'm so confident that, that God is, is present in this, um, in this brokenness, in this time of grief. Um, and so I don't, I don't believe that God has, has gone away, but I believe that the Spirit um, is just a little bit stronger and kind of guiding us, and we just need to listen to it. Because I think for a while now, um, we've been like, all right, all right, you can, you can go sit down, Holy Spirit. Um, but I think we really need to let the Spirit in and say, like, where are, we, where are we called to grow? Or how are the lay people called to really, you know, make, make noise in the church? Um, I'm so confident in the power of lay people. Um, that has been so, so clear to me in the last few months. And so um, God, God is with the lay people. The Spirit is in the lay people. Um, and so how are we called to really, um, you know, make some changes, make some moves, as, as Tiziana was saying. Um, yeah. Thank you. Stephen. Um, I would add to those two nice comments. I think the question is, and to me, where is God? Because God is everywhere. The question is, on whose side is God on? And it's not to take away from the universal love of God to say that God's always first and foremost on the side of victims. And that if we want to find out the truth that God wants us to hear, if we want to be moved with the compassion of Jesus, we have to talk and listen to, first of all, listen to survivors and privilege them and not lawyer up not act as CEOs, not do damage control, and not try to get closure too fast. But honor the victims by listening. And in that, I think, is where we find the presence of God most challenging and most profound. Thank you. I wish we had more time. Uh, and maybe church in the 21st century needs to take these people on the road. Um, this has been an enlightening evening. My takeaways are what Stephen has taught us, honor the victims and listen to them, that we've just started, that rebuilding the church has to be from the ground up, that we have leaders right here, the two people in the middle and the two people on the ends, and that we do need to rebuild the structure of the church, but also something much more difficult, restore the faith and trust that the people in the church have with the hierarchy, but that we're all responsible. Just as trying to track you, that's what I heard you say. The title of our session tonight was Why I Remain a Catholic belief in a time of turmoil. So we're going to end, and I'm just going to ask everyone starting, uh, maybe starting, Stephen, with you, we'll go right down the row. Why do you remain a Catholic? I have to start. Yes. (laughs) I remain Catholic because uh, family affiliation, but deep conviction that I gained after 30 years in theology struggling with How can I be a better Catholic? I'm amazed that we're living in a church in which the Pope is anti-clerical. Sort of. (laughs) What gives me hope is seeing change, seeing young people that care, seeing old people that care, seeing people leave the church but still love the church, realizing that we're in this together I get hope from community above all. Church is, the church is a community. Jesus calls together, and he promises us suffering. 
So we can see Jesus' promise is fulfilled in many different places in the world. But in that hope, what makes it Christian, in that suffering, what makes it Christian is we endure with hope and patience and courage. And we have to get that hope and patience and courage from each other. We don't just sit in our rooms and invent it. We have to get it from each other. So to me, the hope we have to establish is to commit ourselves to community even more on the grassroots, on the local parish level, to get involved, to pray in a community, to live and care for one another, and to show hospitality for the stranger. Thank you. For me, why I remain Catholic, um, this church is my home. This is my place. Um, I have been raised in the church. I've had the great gift of faith in my family. Um, and I'm not going anywhere, even though we are terribly broken right now. Um, this church is, yeah, this is, my, this is my home base. This is the place I go to um, where I fill up for the next week. Um, and so for me, I, I can remain hopeful because I know that Jesus isn't going anywhere. Um, we talk about institutional church and, um, and, and the ways in which, you know, it needs to change and grow and shift. Um, but God is, God is not changing. God is ever-present, ever-loving, um, and ever-full of mercy. And so for me, I think the timing of this, of this panel is so perfect also with Advent, right around the corner. Um, there's nothing like Advent to give me joy which is so needed. We need joy. We have lost it in our church, and it's coming right back. Get ready. <laughs> we need to sit in church. We need to pray and welcome, welcome Jesus anew. I, I find so much hope in the fact that God makes everything new, um, and we get to celebrate that in a few, a few short weeks. So that's really um, what gives me a lot of peace and what, what allows me to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a lot of times this crisis can seem like an utter loss of hope. So another time that I'm similarly recalling right now, just thinking about um, the last two speakers, is that um, when I was in high school, I was on a service trip, and the entire time I was thinking about how I'm just a high school kid, I can't do anything, none of this matters. Three days into the trip, I found out that one of my English professors um, from my high school had passed. It felt utterly terrible. It felt like everything, all those relationships they had built were lost and that, you know, like, what now? Nothing matters. And I thought back to a time when I went to her and I was handing in a test late or something like that. And I was nervous about it. Before she even acknowledged that, she asked me, how are you doing? And it's something simple, but it goes to show how she was willing to step beyond her role as a high school teacher. And what I decided to do was, let's just try this. For the rest of the week, through prayer and reflection, I decided to, I'm gonna step beyond my role as a high school student. And I started engaging with the kids more in classes and that kind of thing. Felt like it was for nothing, felt drained at the end of the week. And this little girl came up to me and she tugged my arm and handed me something. It looked like a rock, I didn't know what it was. And one of the um, teachers in the country, this is in the, the Dominican Republic, she said that it's a seashell, it's a gift. And this crisis has forced me to ask myself, so what is my seashell? What is that symbol that what you do matters? And I think that in times of crisis like this, you have a choice to either engage um, with these questions, to reflect, to listen, to take action, to do the small things that you can through community and belonging to an identity, or you can choose to be consumed by anger and rage. So I'm constantly trying to ask myself, what is my seashell? What is it that keeps me going? And I think that I would invite you guys to do that along with me. And that's my hope for the future, is that shared dialogue. So. Thank you, Sean. You have the last word. Last but not least, huh? Uh, so three quick answers. One, parish priests have taken a beating through this process. But there is no question that part of the reason that my faith is so deep are two parish priests, uh, Father William Fitzgerald. And while most people don't know him as a parish priest, I did, Father J. Brian Hare. And their roles in my life and in my formation have had profound sticking power for my faith, and I want to honor them and acknowledge them with that. The second thing is um, 
My Catholicism is how I know God. I don't ever want to be disconnected from God. And my Catholicism, the sacraments, the practice of faith and community, um, mass, are how I know God. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is every corner and aspect of my life is animated by the social mission that Christ handed down to us. So to Tiziana and to Sean and to Stephanie and Stephen, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for discussing difficult issues. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you.